Hello everyone. <clears throat> Another episode finds the moment. I wanted to really speak about that people define themselves and they define themselves through, you can say, inner masks. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, spoke about archetypes. The archetypes are kind of like an alphabet that you're not conscious of. Think of it as an alphabet of images that some of these alphabets, some of these letters, you don't know where they are in your psyche, in your mind. <clears throat> we have someone uh, something that Carl Jung did was Carl Jung did something genius. I don't think a lot of people realize it, but he developed uh, a term, a way of speech uh, for this idea, the collective unconscious. And this idea is, I would say the next phase of our species where the person is first looking at what they don't know, then they look at what the collective doesn't know. And the term unconscious, there's a reverse to it, the conscious mind. Right now I'm speaking to you, I'm in the conscious waking state, all the alphabet, all the imagery, everything that I'm saying to you, it's as if in, it's in my conscious mind. Now something I've noticed is that when I start giving these talks in the middle of my conscious mind, go, abiding by a rhythm, I think it accesses the unconscious. And I feel everybody has access to way more information than they are conscious of. So therefore we have a conscious mind and then there's the unconscious and these archetypes are not all necessarily conscious. I'll give you an example. For example, let's say the person is conscious of, <clears throat> let's say having, um, uh, let's say the person has an archetype of a mother, father, but he doesn't, have, the person doesn't have an archetype of an uncle, imagine, right? So that person, imagine you're a kid, you don't have the archetype of an uncle in your mind. <clears throat> and you go to your friend's house and you see the, uh, your friend's uncle, you know, their cool uncle or something. <clears throat> now, that uncle is not your uncle. You're not seeing your uncle, but technically you are getting an archetype of what an uncle looks like. You know, it's, you can kind of say, just like how people learn again, like the alphabet, these are images of classification of uh, ex experiencing life as a narrative. So I would say, sorry guys, I, I've decided to do something where um, I'm going to actually make the thing full screen and I will attend the comments and the uh, certain intervals through the talk. <clears throat> because I've noticed when I pay attention to the comment section, I, my attention goes to the person who's commenting. So then I got to climb myself back up to the talk again. <clears throat> so um, here, pretty much I'm saying um, there is, so there is the idea of the unconscious, and then there's the idea of the conscious mind. Then there's the notion of what is the content of the conscious mind, and what is the content of the unconscious mind. <clears throat> the content of the unconscious mind, we actually treat it like, for example, the person dreamed of a giant bird. What does that mean? The person dreamed like they're flying. What does that mean? The person dreamed they're dying. You know, they died. What does that mean? Right? So you can, we treat dreams as if the unconscious mind is communicating to us consciously <clears throat> but what i think is going on is we have actually a conscious mind that has two levels and we don't realize it 
We cannot experience the con unconscious purely as an individual. I feel this is impossible. What that means is even if somebody comes up with this idea that, all right, man, what if we're multidimensional beings and what if I'm here living a conscious life and simultaneously in another parallel reality, I'm living an unconscious life. What about that? You know, isn't that dual? And I'll be like, you know, the thing is, the moment you are witnessing a duality, you're multidimensional. The moment you get to the third point, it becomes, the system becomes multidimensional. That means anytime you witness duality, you can wield it. Pretty much anything you observe, you can use, you know? You can wield, like skill, in regards to skill. Now, <clears throat> I have no idea what this wallpaper I've chosen is from, but it felt to me as if like, <clears throat> uh, you know, an, a new archetypal definition. And it's fascinating how much of life is accepted into position. So now back into what I mean by um, self-defining, archetypal self-defining. There's, there's a crucial thing I'm, I'm suggesting with that. All right, so let's say Carl Jung spoke about the conscious mind. He spoke about the unconscious mind. Somebody else came after Carl Jung and created the term subconscious mind or something, you know. So what does that mean? These are concentric circles. This is like your conscious mind is a circle. Then there's a bigger circle around it, your subconscious. And then the bigger circle, your unconscious. And eventually, it's a spectrum of the more we focus on ourself, we're individual and objective. The more we focus on what is beyond ourself, the, sub the more subjective... <clears throat> and um, non-individual it appears, you know, when I think about the world, I can't think about it individually. I mean, I can, I can say this is what I see about the world, but I know that it is so vast, it is so big, and we're just eyes, uh, you know, on an anthill looking at this hill and thinking we know it. There's so much here that it's like we can try as hard as we can, but until our language evolves, we can't touch any of the new archetypes. So uh, let us say that um, this alphabet of images, for example, the person has the archetype of the mother, father, man, woman, you know, uh, politician, you know, labor, all these things, you know. So if your archetypes are based on the past, there is nothing new. Have you noticed? That means it is true, you know, the past may clap for you when you listen to it, <clears throat> but it's as if it, there's nothing new. And so imagine two human beings, you know, and one human being copying exactly what their ancestors did, and one human being doing something new and creating a new archetype. <clears throat> you know, that's the value of it. That means it's, it's like either you're defining your identity in accordance to an image of yourself in the future or in the past. In the present, you can hover, but you're not an individual. That's the thing about the present. When the, when the present is like the, the bottom of the inverted triangle and the two lines go up, you know, and then you have the past and future. It's as if, honestly, the past and future are originating from the same point. And that point is attributeless. So in the here and now is actually where we cannot be a self. We are the moment. But when we think about the past, yeah, we used to be that thing. When we think about the future, oh, yeah, we're going to be that thing, you know. So really, it's like, just like how people clothe themselves, people clothe their mind with archetypal roles, you know. That means we're all kids, but what happens? We are kids until we have kids. Do you see what I mean? There's, there's something like that where it's, it's like it's just phases. It's like a spiral and we're on one curvature of the spiral thinking that <clears throat> all of knowledge is at our disposal, you know. For me, it's like I didn't ask for it, but it was kind of like, 
you can say it's like the person didn't ask for the unknown but opened their door and realized there was a universe as if like who delivered who ordered all this unknown you know <laughs> I remember, um, you know, many, many first, many things I've tried for the first time. I've honestly forget, forgotten the first time I've tried it. But there was one thing I'll never forget, and it was the first day. This was years ago. I think it was two thousand after two thousand eleven, somewhere thirteen, twelve. <clears throat> and uh, I decided to. I remember writing the first sentence that I felt came from me. You know. And I wrote the sentence, and I, I felt it was the, my entrance into being a writer and my to my own self, you know. And the sentence was, "I don't want to live in a world that looks the same the next day." And I remember writing that down, taping that piece of paper <clears throat> awkwardly to my wall, and looking at that. That I don't want to live in a world that looks the same day. So, what is the value of living in the same world? You know, it could be something mind-boggling that the future generations, a thousand years from now, they will look back and they will be like, oh my God, people were fighting over beliefs that did not arise from their time. You know, we can have this attitude that as if like a belief should be fresh, you know, a lion doesn't go eat, you know, the carcass of a dead animal. And so what if our lives of meaning, you know, sometimes the archetypes we have to be, it's like, do we want to try the new or <clears throat> live as the past did? That means, imagine your ancestors lived so hard and they got by to the next level and you were born and then they're like, they were watching, imagine from the sidelines of, you know, some sort of eternal picture and they were looking and they were like, what is this? We live so hard just for this uh, descendant of our, just this, this like, uh, you know, the next genetical torchbearer to just do the same thing. You know, it's kind of, it's, it's scary. It's savage. If we do the same things as they did in the past only, then it makes no sense. Then it's as if our ancestors lived for themselves. It's like pure selfishness of all the types and ways that life can be lived. And you know that there was something that in the world, in the two world wars, <clears throat> that happened. What was it like? Eighty-five million people died. So think about eighty-five million people who were like flowers that deserve to grow in in the garden of human society. Yet they all er were eradicated on the battlefield. Do you know? So what does that mean? That means 85 million people uh, missed out. You know, the potential of an advanced civilization missed out on 85 million people because war was blindness. Because fools had the microphone. So imagine 85 million people, their lives being occupied by an insignificant, <clears throat> all war is insignificant events. You know, I, somebody can say a war was significant, but I'll tell you, no. You know, it's just throwing metal at fast speeds, you know, when we're very fragile creatures is the dumbest thing you could do. You know, that's pretty much war. People have been using metal to break each other. Pretty much we're like, imagine a civilization of glass people and people like they're made of glass killing each other, breaking each other. Do you know, a civilization of glass breaking itself is like there's nothing there to see. Sometimes I, I feel if our species makes too many mistakes,
poetically, if <coughs> galactic eyes passed by, I would just be like, hey, keep going, folks. Nothing to see here on Earth. You know, because how embarrassing it is for a creature, a species, not to know its own potential. It's like, it's like, it's, you know what it is? It's like the, this, the, the individual has accepted the inefficient before the efficient. And any time you do that, you have lost before you begin. If you, before you, let's say you don't know, <clears throat> let's say you're a soccer player, okay? And it's a penalty. You know, it's a penalty shootout. If you are afraid, if you ha don't have certainty of your own feet, the movement of your own feet, <clears throat> before you kick the ball, the, it's as if you, you didn't know what you were doing to even receive its outcome. You know, I feel sometimes who uh, the people that karma, like a butterfly, you know, gifts, lands on, are those who have accepted the world, they have accepted themselves, now the only thing they haven't accepted is the event. You see, it's as if some beings have no issues with their physical existence, you know? Their objective existence is very easy, very complete. They don't have to worry. Imagine like the child of a prince, you know, or princess prin uh, prince, you know. They don't have to worry about their uh, 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 outer realms. They have to worry about their inner realms. But now imagine a person who didn't have to worry about their outer realms, didn't have to worry about your inner realms. Where are you left <clears throat> after you have gone on the uh, greatest mystical escapade of beyonds? You will come to the unknown... And the unknown is where the no, is the new is born. You know? Novelty. It's the greatest force. We thought more having more knowledge makes us creative. No. <clears throat> it's, it's recognizing your unknown and what, noticing what hasn't manifested yet in the realm. You know, imagine someone you've never met. You ask them, who are you? The answer they will give. Is a new self to you. Is a new self definition. Anytime anyone's asked, what are you doing? It's like literally the person scopes, scans the moment. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and shares the archetype that has defined itself. Sometimes archetypes could not be defined by you. Sometimes you, who you think you are could not be defined by your own free will. It could be defined by the free will of your environment, you know? So the self-defining, the archetype, is a linguistic image. It is an image of an image. That's what an archetype is. It's an image of uh, before a subject becomes an event. So think of it this way. We're just stuff. Then <coughs> the stuff moves. Then we say the body is animate. The body got a moving, living body. You know? And then think of it in regards to subjectivity. That as thoughts move, the mind exists. Just like your body has to physically move, you know? Like a person could sit down and think as if they've climbed a mountain, but have they? You see, so the, the body has to move. So similarly, the inner realms 
uh, the mind of the person also is moving. And that's one of the biggest insights of <clears throat> the nature of what's going on on this planet in regards to our experience, that it's a moving event, that something has been set in motion, and while you're in the motion of emotion, you are what, wondering what is going on. You know, we are moving. It's, it's, it's like we have made the world feel too easy. Yeah, we could just define it. We could just write truth like a sentence on a piece of paper. Yeah, if it only was that easy. You know, <clears throat> if we were just creatures of language, yeah, we could just say that we want a better world and it'll literally instantly happen. But because we're creatures of material form, the language is like the spirit guide. So it's kind of strange. It's like your mind is, is guiding the spirit of your body, how your body animates. <clears throat> and what is guiding the mind, as the Bhagavad Gita would say, the, like <clears throat> imagine the metaphor of a chariot where the horses are the body, uh, uh, the chariot driver is the mind, and the person in the chariot is the soul. That means technically there is this view that nobody actually knows who they are, that their mind is riding the body to get somewhere. That means we, it's a, imagine treating your physical existence as a chariot <coughs> for your as a chariot for your eyes, you know, for your soul. You know, the soul is just an unknown intelligent variable, that's it. And the known intelligent variable is the body. That means either our intelligence is just from us, either it is <clears throat> from the world in us, or it is just from the world, the world that we cannot fathom. As if everybody is like the imagination of a higher <clears throat> dimensional activity and we're like yo or is, is the world made of matter or mind and so it's like we hear laughter in the sky not knowing where it comes from we are in the mind of a cosmic entity And sometimes it's strange, you know, just taking this notion that, it, like, where does a thought come from? You see, it's instant. You know, it's like suddenly someone comes and tells you something. What if somebody told, what if <clears throat> God's God told God to build man, you know? Even though the notion of God is inconceivable in accordance to different traditions, We open our eyes and we become what we see. And if we have an ability to change what we see, we become something else. And it has from the beginning been as simple as that, <clears throat> that your eyes are the leader of your meaning. You know, imagine right now I'm closing my eyes and I'm visualizing a world, a city, a lot of my science fiction is like this. <clears throat> I'm visualizing, let's say, a world and imagine a character in that world is wondering how they're alive. Imagine I have imagined an inner city, 
right now as I'm speaking to you, I'm imagining like a world behind my eyes. As if like from the sky, I'm looking down at a city and I can see a character of my own mind. I'm generating the vision in my, like I'm pretty much saying visualize like you're <clears throat> like a God looking at a city. You know, but it's a city of your imagination, something you have imagined. Now imagine a character in that city. Now imagine that character in the city trying to communicate to you. That's what I feel is the relationship of man and the divine. That the only way you can communicate is that you trust the form to arise. That means I don't know. There's so much in this life that the person doesn't know, even with things they're familiar with. It's just you look at how this, the, the, the um, you know, I guess archaically, the soul of the moment was being uh, moving. How the soul of the moment was moving. <clears throat> how the soul was moving in the moment. Okay, there we go. I mean, think about it. Everybody is uh, after money, running after information. Even, let's say, even before money, people nowadays need information. So we are in this information phase where information is really important. But when we really look at that, it's how we're seeing stuff in form. So your archetypal self-definitioning, uh, self-defining <clears throat> if it's from the past there is no room for the design to update it has its meaning before it starts moving that means if I if I believe in something I don't need to believe in anything else as if the mind has found what it wants to occupy itself <clears throat> with throughout the day, you know? But if the person doesn't have necessarily a belief or a disbelief and they just go live in the world, they go let the world be unknown and let the known be revealed, <clears throat> then they can actually, you can actually experience knowledge. I think everybody has good karma and bad karma simultaneously. They just have to tune into it. They choose where their attention is choosing <clears throat> if they are walking in the dimmer part of the room or the brighter part of the room. You know what I feel art, <clears throat> all artists are doing? I feel every generation there are people who they want to close the collective imagination, close the door of the collective imagination, do you know? And I see the artists of every generation, you know, <clears throat> kind of putting their foot from letting this door close. Do you know, that means man did not accept what he was. Man did not believe in his four-limbed animal hoodness. Do you know, he stood up on two legs. That means if we kept believing that we, everybody had to be on four limbs, you know, imagine there was a, <clears throat> let's say there was like some, in the future, there, like this is a hilarious story, but imagine like, like <laughs> there is a dictator in the future that says because human beings are animals we shouldn't walk on our two legs no animal walks on its two legs like this you know and so it's as if everybody is forced to walk on their hands can you imagine and imagine we had scholars believing some scholars saying no we believe you have to walk on your four hands this is this is with four limbs this is the sacred law this is what our ancestors wanted and some people are like no man we can walk on two legs and use our hands for other things and you know there's this collision <clears throat> of staying to, uh in the mold of, in in the shadow of the past or going towards the light of the future two options really you either do, uh, do, you either move first and the world is given meaning by your free will, by your inner realm, or you let the world move first and the world gives your inner realm meaning.
pretty much how the person is defining their themselves is in a role. You know, the archetypes or rules, they're like scripts, you know, they're like um, <clears throat> lines for an actor. It's a position, I would say, not lines, but the archetype, it's like the language comes from the archetype. Based on me feeling who I am, I am sharing these words. <clears throat> I can't see if somebody d didn't have an impression on who they are, how they could even speak. So it's a game of self in the inner realms. You know, how the person is defining the self, uh, what alphabet of image they're using. <clears throat> imagine, so, you know, you could say there's a child and imagine this child, the parents are savage, and, like wild. You know, they're, they're uh, uh, very cruel, imagine. Imagine a child is born with cruel parents. You know, and imagine a child that's born with uh, parents that are not cruel. For one child, the archetype of mother and father father have become wrath. For another child, the archetype of mother and father have become mercy and grace. Do you see what I mean? So it's not like the archetypes are set in stone, even though Carl Jung felt it was like that a bit. <clears throat> but um, I feel the archetypes are molded. I feel literally like the Transformers in, in the movie Transformers, the, the car, the car like saw a better car and it transformed to that. I feel that the moment we see something that can happen, something, something can happen another way, we have access to choosing that way. I mean, think about it. If somebody asks the, um, anybody, imagine an alien comes down and the alien's like, yo, human beings, where did language come from? We'd be like, it came from our mind, you know, just like where you came from. <laughs> You see, language comes from the mind. All archetypes are an engagement. The person, because they have to, a person makes a decision in, in order to implement the effort of their energy into like some format of a person. That means there's choice. That means, like, think of it this way. <clears throat> there's imagine like there's uh, um, you know you're in an airplane and the stewardess is asking you. Uh, uh, if you want apple juice or orange juice. Now, before deciding you want apple juice or orange juice, the person is deciding, am I thirsty or not? <clears throat> Do you see what I mean? There's like another, There, I think all ultimately all accesses of human psychology come down to a binary system. I'm not joking, guys. We, our psychologies it are a simulation of literally the absence of light and I call it the on and off switch effect. One thing that ev all our ancestors were influenced by and it's epigenetical <clears throat> and <clears throat> you can't even say it's epigene epigenetical because the, genet the genetics were designed based on those conditions. You know, so it's kind of very strange from a macrocosmic angle to see even epigenetics or something influencing the being from inside or outside, you know. It's like, um, you know, the ant wondering about its inner realms, outer realms, but the ant is in the shoulder, on the shoulder of a giant, you know what I mean? So the self is a phenomena of language, the definition is a phenomena of language, and the archetype, it is, I guess, a memory coming into the conscious mind. There has been times where not just in talks, just certain moments of my life, <clears throat> I felt an intensity that came from not my conscious archetype. There's been moments where I've moved in certain ways, you know, just, just felt certain, noticed certain things in the moment where I could say it's not from a conscious archetype. I honestly feel 
<clears throat> our consciousness is the tip of the iceberg and everything else that we think is impossible is actually the mind is simulating it for itself. So that's the thing. If you're defining yourself based on the past, you have a, a, a history to have a story of being hurt or defeated. Do you know that means? Imagine somebody gets defeated. Somebody fails in front of you. And you ask them, hey, man, you know, why did you fail? The person's like, fail? I didn't fail. And you're like, no, everybody saw you. You just failed. He's like, no, I didn't fail. And you ask the person, why? How did, how did you not fail? And the person said, am I dead? <laughs> You know, it's like as long as you're alive, there is something that could be done, you know. And uh, Charles in the chat section brought a very interesting point. An actor plays many roles. Yeah, it's not just an actor. Your body goes through you. You are not experiencing one physical body to be a pure materialist as if like, all right, so which body am I? Do you know who am I? Am I when, when, me when I was like 10 years old? Am I me when I was 20? Am I me? And so on, you see? You know, I think nature is, is designed so incredibly that the human psyche has its own backup system built into it. What does that mean? That means even if a society and civilization is becoming messed up and cruel and all this stuff, do you know, there will always be observers to any system who after observing it and reaching a certain observer threshold, they animate. <clears throat> I honestly feel this life is... Um, There's a lineup for Earth. There's a giant lineup. There's a giant lineup to be here. People don't realize it. We are in the most, we're not in, I will tell you, we're, we're not in hell and we're not in heaven. <coughs> we are on the one and only Earth. So what does that mean? That means this is the perfect ground. I honestly feel we are multidimensional construction workers. <clears throat> Eight billion of us. <laughs> just, you know, we're, we were just like 8 billion disembodied beings who were like, all right, let's do this. Let's build this. Or, bah! You know, like incarnation, 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 you know, yet it's a collective vision from the beginning. That means like there are so many different notes played, but it's one melody. You know, and even Beethoven says, don't just practice your art, but force your way into its secrets for it and knowledge can raise man to the divine. What does that mean? As you force your way into the secrets of your craft and you can say your art, art form is actually your living. That means you don't have to be an artist. You know, to literally, you don't have to literally like draw stuff, you know, <laughs> you, you just have to realize that it's like your engagement. That means art begins not from when the, <clears throat> what the paint touches the canvas, but from the moment the artist touches the brush, the artwork has begun. The artwork has begun even way before it manifests in shape. Think of all the things you've desired in life and how the desire has brewed in some inner <clears throat> atmosphere of consideration of various probabilities of self after that desire and the person just goes forth and makes a decision. If you're defined by the future, you actually are saluting the unknown. If you're defined by the, if your archetypal self is it, the role you're playing here is based on Okay, so let me say it like this. If it's based on the future, it's unknown. If it's based on the past, it's known. That means it's so much easy. It's so easy for me to just forget everything and be like, I believe the whole world is like, I, I, I said this as a joke. <clears throat> Imagine iced teaism. Imagine I believe the whole universe is like the shape of an iced tea. And it, it, what we think is consciousness is iced tea poured in a cup, you know? Imagine I believe this and I declare, all right, guys, forget everything, all the Mr. Within talks, you know, 
It's like, it's just iced tea. All of it, this is iced tea. It's higher dimensional iced tea. <laughs> you see, it, you don't evolve. That's the issue of trying to stay true to the past. You've missed out on uh, the evolution of truth. You miss out on the evolution of your own eyes. That means if we stop trying to be the same, and if we stop trying to be different, we're only left in the explorer's state. That means, imagine you realized your whole life you're drawing an artwork, which at the end of it, everything you've drawn is going to be gone. Do you know? <clears throat> like literally your artwork, uh, there's, a temp there's a temporary nature that I, I often, I mean, I brush up poetically on, but it's something that is so left for experience, like the true pure creation and pure destruction they are not for the known individual. They're not forces. That means somebody who goes towards so much pure goodness, they're not human. Somebody who goes too much pure, too much chaos, they are not human. Do you know? Do you see what I mean? <clears throat> I think the trick to this system, this plane of existence, is to pilot uh, is to pilot selflessly it's to selflessly be the self that the world is being it sounds strange but i feel that's <clears throat> that's kind of like accurate that it's literally, think about it. Imagine there was an elephant in front of you. You know, or imagine if you were on the back of an elephant. You know, would you hit the elephant? Would you desire more and be like, go faster, elephant, go faster? You know, sometimes we should treat the mind like a living phenomena, like a living being. When I started to treat my mind like a living being, I realized how I was being alive. But if we treat the mind as this in a lifeless, in an empty room, then you're you're choosing emptiness. So you don't you can never even see the potential if there is any. And that's the thing, you know, you're gonna I think people are gonna wake up to this notion, they're gonna realize why I'm saying now we're in the era of advanced communication. Where communication more than any other technology is has a priority to be updated because communication defines the user of technology. So the, the better pictures we have, <clears throat> the better, the more updated alphabet of imagery we have, we can say we are archetypally less limited. Because an archetype is a limitation. Keep that in mind. The moment you choose to be something, you can't be other things in regards to the outer realms. You know, not that you can't be other things, but it's just like, I mean, in the sense that the commitment of the attention. So like, <clears throat> I, have, I, I have different approaches where throughout the years I've kind of like adjusted my own system. But um, I pretty much treat uh, the moment as unknown and I let myself to get surprised by the known. And when I do that, what tends to happen is that there comes this, this simple expectation, not a complex expectation of the world, just an expectation for it to move simply. That means when I think about tomorrow, I just think, all right, I'm a, just a creature simply getting by, you know, on a rock in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Right, so I have a simple notion of the outer realm events because you can see any sort of complexity, but at the end, you just want to hear the outer realm's voice. You know, I'm telling you, there has been times that I haven't gotten tired of the inner realms, but you know how like, like you see a someone in a let's say a bazaar, like a store owner being the store, 
and just in his break, just go outside, you know, for a little bit and then come back. You know, so it's like sometimes I've had breaks from my own mind. And those breaks are actually, it's like sometimes when you hover so selflessly, you miss your own self. You know, that's the sign that you're human. You know, we think emotions are <clears throat> something bad. A lot of people think stoicism means, uh, sorry, was it stoicism? Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I think I heard it from a few people that it was like they thought stoicism to be stoic meant not to be emotional. When you realize the content of your mind is semi your choice, then the person doesn't get bothered. That means you could sit down, be watching TV, like an annoying ad comes on TV, you see the ad, but it doesn't bother you. It doesn't leave an impression. It's as if you, you it's like you have become the wind of your own moment, you know? If, I, if there was one element, I would tell you, like some people have spoken about, <clears throat> like I remember <clears throat> some friends speaking about animal spirit guides being in dialogue. Like you don't know how many people have spoken about this. There was a friend I had named, uh, what was his name? Joel. Yeah, for some time I knew this person, Joel. And um, he was part of this social circle. And uh, uh, Joel, he was a military person. Uh, yeah, Colombian. I think he was Colombian. And uh, anyways, pretty much he said something that he always felt a bond with animals. He felt like he always had some sort of closeness with animals, you know, like an, as if an animal guide, right? And pretty much the point I'm trying to make is imagine elements. Every person has an elemental guide, you know? That means some people imagine like instead of them having a guardian kangaroo, <laughs> you know, it's like, what's your animal? Spirit guides, kangaroo, man, chill out. <laughs> Jumping between dimensions, you So much of life happens even then we ascribe the meaning. Sometimes even the meaning isn't, even though the mind, you can say the unconscious is doing its work, but <clears throat> yeah, sometimes we experience the event, then look for the language. Sometimes we have language and then we experience the event. And I think the key thing is like in, in Zen mindfulness, the guy, pretty much the idea is that before you do anything in this life, you attain inner peace. That means you see this picture of this girl who probably she looks like she's gonna go conquer the world or something you know <clears throat> it's imagine if if this it's like here's the thing you could be an evil person but still have inner peace you know you could be a good person and still have inner peace you could also not be a person and still have inner peace you know so the whole point of it is recognizing how the mind is activated in the moment how your mind is active just like how you turn on your Wi-Fi on your phone and it shows the routers nearby. <clears throat> Similarly, it's kind of like that for your own mind. <clears throat> and you find even hidden stories. Sometimes in my dreams, it's as if I'm part of different lives that I don't even know are going on. Like a person's dream life, I think it's there to say, yeah, you thought it was reality, huh? <laughs> you thought there was only reality. Yeah. <laughs> it's like people were like, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm definitely, I, I get it. It's only materials here. You know, it's just stuff. It's all atomic. But why do we dream, for God's sakes? What is this stuff, you know? I'm trying to live a normal, very down-to-earth life, but then I have a dream, an experience of my mind while my body is asleep. What is this mind doing? So many people are fascinated by the content of their dream state. Not a lot of people study their dream state. They don't even wonder about its implication. I'll tell you, dreams are rooms. The mind is building layers when you sleep. 
just like the body heals slowly like building layers upon itself similarly the mind builds layers upon itself this is why if if you're conscious in a dream yeah, I mean, some people are focused on moving in the dream. But let me tell you, you can reverse engineer back into your waking state consciously from your dream. I've done this twice. I've had two dreams where literally midway in the dream, I've come, I've literally scrolled back, like coming through a tunnel of various layers of context back into the moment and being awake. That means I could tell you I have been awake in a dream and with that same level of wakefulness, I've woken up in the morning and been shocked because I, my whole body was w awake before I had woken up. Do you know what I mean? That means imagine opening your eyes, <clears throat> but um, like in the morning, but as if you had already, your eyes were already open. Pretty much it was an experience of my mind's sight being awake. It was as if my mind had retained its wakefulness from the dream state to the conscious waking state. Now there is um, certain writings, for example, in the Rebu Gita, <clears throat> where it shares... You know, guys, I was just thinking, like, think about our language. What do people, what are people chasing in this world? Their dreams. We're, we're, we're a physical object, but we have desires of a subject. Like, that is so fascinating to me. Because an object doesn't have a desire. Do you know? It's fascinating that we think we're just objects. But there's all this subjective level of phenomenology going on. The ontology of ideological living, how we are becoming an idea that we are alive in. The mystery is here. People don't realize it. This is why I feel very bold giving these talks. Because no, it's the unknown. Nobody knows yet. We are in that phase where anybody attempts the exploration, you have contributed to the future. You know? Imagine 8 billion human beings, they were <clears throat> journaling their inner realms honestly. And as they were journaling their inner realms honestly, this was being shared with the tribe. We were hunter gatherers of our minds, of the unknown potential of how stuff can become animate. So my point is, we have deluded ourselves by just zooming in on how the, language, the object is limited to the specific linguistic design. Pretty much the species has taken language so seriously, it has forgotten it's an explorer and people out of fear are attaching to our past archetypes. Rather than using the past archetypes as a toolbox, use the past only when you need it. The past is database, it's archives. My memories are like my archives. Like I, you know, it's not like a cabinet where you pull it out. I mean, for example, Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, this French emperor, his inner realms were so strange where in his writings, like there was something you revealed that it was as if like it was a cabinet. So this dude, this, Kong, this man who was being an emperor, in his mind, literally he had this giant table where every part of it had different files of different missions, briefings, and whatnot. You know? So for example, Napoleon wielded his inner realms through the image of a table. You know, he managed his psyche you know, from its fragmentation into an organization through that metaphor. For me, I'm personally saying you don't need a metaphor, but it's not bad to start with, you know. That means for me, it was a lot through the elements since my childhood. Since my childhood, just 
the a being controlling elements outside of themselves you don't know how much like when i was like 11 i was googling tele telekinesis being like what is this you know how can i clean my room without moving my, you know <laughs> and uh you know, I tried, you don't know, I, there was this something called a PSI wheel. I remember putting that on this needle. You put this kind of like, you know, pretty much imagine a square divided into four triangles. But imagine you do that with a piece of paper and you put that piece of paper on a needle, <clears throat> you know. So that cone-like piece of paper is on that needle. And the, and the whole point of it was you look at it and move it with your mind. And you don't know, I did this for such a long time. Then I'm like, oh, man, the air conditioning is on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, later on, I understood how you can wield the elements. I feel I saw a glimpse of the secret of the sages. Uh, sorry, not the secret of the sages, the secret of the mages, the archetypes of the elemental wielders. You see, right now in my inner realms, I, I am already an airbender. Everybody is. You know, you can imagine various things just by seeing, getting exposed to the idea. Just like a musician hears a new note and it blows their mind and they incorporate it in their whole musical system. You know, <clears throat> it's like that. You know, it's like, how long do we need to wait for the epic humanity to look in the mirror, finally? You know, we, we, have, we should have one morality, greatness, go. You know, that should, that should be it. Do you know anything that is far from it is, has not seen the value of human potential? That means the issue is, we have been telling ourselves, excuse my language, but a weak AF story of our own humanhood. We have made ourselves strangely ideologically inferior to the actual cosmic event, you know? We should hopefully have a civilization where the idea of birth and death is, is becomes a bit archaic, where it's only, you know, as if pilots entering the plane of uh, existence and pilots leaving. Of course, that's, that's the way I see it, but I'm saying, for me, it's a sort of consciousness that we're multidimensional, so we stop freaking out about how the language of our life defined our existential situation in an unsettling way. You know, technically, everybody is wielding the elements because your body's made of the elements, the periodic table, so you, everybody's kind of like the periodic table moving somehow, you know? <laughs> we are all like the mind... We are literally the mind of the periodic table. This, everything we see as intelligent is literally like the periodic table dancing in unique, mysterious ways, you know? And so the fact that yet we have even re, after four billions of, billion years of evolution and like, you know, it's parts of the brain, the brain wasn't something that even though it's genetically the way it was crafted was it took millions of years. For certain developments, human beings just had to go through some experiences, you know. And even like what's fascinating is that the human being goes through many portal experiences. We have our mind is, is, is living life like a caterpillar. The transformation of the mind is stepping from world to world. We're going to realize probably you know, at some point in our evolutionary development where the species from uh, underwater stepped onto land, that was the first portal experience. And that echoed a psychological, that echoed something for a psychological formation. What it is, is the world is trying to raise man. You see, the world has, has like a marathon a person hitting the, like you see it in, sh in you, you know, in some, <laughs> like old school, somebody would shoot, a, shoot the gun in the air and everybody would start running in a marathon, you know what I mean? And so when we can treat life as an advanced opportunity rather than an inefficient obstacle, inefficient, inevitable, con rather than an, I shouldn't say obstacle, inefficient circumstance, that it's like what? You, you, you choose to be weak. The world slams you down. You think the world has, the, like, you know, in these talks, I, you know, people may appear polite, but the world has its rudeness. The world has its wilderness. 
That means if you treat the, the, the city as a concrete jungle, there is no such thing as good and bad. There's just human beings that are behaving like uh, animalistic. The, their behavior is taking them back to, into the cave, you know, and some people who their behavior takes them out of the caves they're in. This world is meant to be explored. Its meaning is based on uh, inter uh, effort. Imagine zero, one, zero, one. Pretty much all of life is you effort, no effort. Effort, no effort. It doesn't matter that what you do changes so much, you know? And we haven't had a lot of archetypes of strength. Maybe this is the phase. Maybe we have to be the generations that lived weak. Maybe we have to be the inefficient civilizations of the future civilizations. Yeah, it could totally be the case that we have to go through this phase of history so the future generations have the memory, you know. You know, the cobra is actually, I mean, I don't think this is a cobra. No, it is a cobra, I think. this thing. But the cobra has a very unique, no, it's like a rattlesnake. But the cobra has a very unique archetype. For example, in Buddhism, the cobra was like this very enlightened creature. And like, I don't know, pretty much it was raining in Buddha. The cobra became an umbrella for Buddha. You know what I mean? There's literally this video on YouTube where there's this kid in India and three cobras are defending this kid. You know, it's kind of poetic, you know. We are striving for the infinite, yet we are finite. We are motivated by the eternal, yet circumstances are temporary. And so really what we have, which we should use, is really shifting from physical communication where the body language is violent people are violent. you can say there is there is a bit distrust in civilization you know not a bit a lot but <clears throat> like it's like when you walk out in society for me it's like i know like the streets uh have seen it all you know You know, it's also this notion of befriending your own intelligence. That means it's like when you befriend something, you're, it's like you're being what you are and that which is there is being what it is. You know, it's only when there is desire or attachment to a face in the void that things get messy, you know. That means the greatest teaching that an interdimensional being has for being in our dimension is look in the mirror. That's it. I'm telling you, that's the, that's the secret of the veil. It's a mirror. And only when you accept it, you can see beyond your reflection. You can move past your own reflection. You know, it's as if like there's times where I look at my individual life and I'm like, yeah, been there, done that, <laughs> do you know, it's as if I'm, I've lived as an individual, do you know, but then I, after a point, you're like, what is this, is it, is it like everybody's trying to catch the ball, you know, and just run to the finish line, is, it, is, is this the whole game we're playing, or is there, there, or should there be, you know, more of an acknowledgement that the mind needs to live its life now, 
And so freedom has become conditional due to language. Literally, it's like a program. You know, it's like, why do people read books? I mean, if you imagine you're an advanced avian species, let's say you're an avian species watching, you know, the human species, right? And you're like, why are these guys buying books? It doesn't make sense. The alien is shocked. It's like the aliens are watching us mind boggled. They're like, these guys, their brains are antennas for the whole cos cosmic activity, yet they feel they can only absorb knowledge through just written ink on a page. Do you know, what if knowledge was how the moment was alive, regardless of, you know, the definition? Archetypes come and go. It's like the season. Archetypes are like, honestly, flowers in a garden. Some archetypes you consciously maintain. That means throughout the years I've been changing as a human being, but the archetype of like the theme for this show, the only way I've been able to keep it is because I see myself outside of it, you know? Sometimes the best way you can maintain something is not from inside of it, it's from outside of it, you know. There is even this, uh, you know, metaphysical idea that uh, the mind shouldn't be inside. Sorry, not the mind, that the, the, the idea of the soul, the Atman, it should, like from, it's like the over soul should administer the mind. Uh, let me say it in another way. The mind trusts its being and then the body can do anything. If there isn't that trust of what you are or even the basic acceptance of it, you can't live. <laughs> do you know that means it's like you can't drink a glass of water if you, if you can't hold the cup. Do you see what I mean? So you gotta you gotta project levels of strength. It, it, oftentimes, it's not like we we are a certain kind of person. We are an emergent personality in accordance to the environments we go. Even in Japan, there's a saying they say, "The man is the room he enters." So these archetypes can be see rooms where we animate as rules to respond to the momentary circumstance, to the momentary landscape, visible landscape. So imagine in the future, you know, there is visible studies and there's invisible studies. I saw all of academia dividing between the unknown, unknown studies and known studies, really. That people are looking at what we know. They're studying the relationship of all of knowledge with the past. That means we're going to have experts on the future and experts on the past, you know, rather than specific classifications. Because really, at the end of it, it's limited because we want to, it's like, let's say you find something, right? You got to, after you, ha you find something, you, you have to incorporate it in the system. In order to incorporate it in the system, you have to see its existence in the system. So you have to actually see a new system in order to be able to live as a new self here. You have to let the world not be the same world so you can experience a new self. And that's pretty much all of mindfulness, this whole uh, significance of non-duality, you know. Sometimes I feel it, it can totally be an escapism. I'll give you an example. The escapism isn't even conscious. So what does that mean? That means imagine you are a great violinist, okay, and as this great violinist, you have not decided to play the violin. And you have gone playing the drums as if like your hands were built for a different instrument, you know. And so you're playing this drum and it's, it's kind of like suddenly in the middle of that awkward drum playing, your hands are remembering the memory. It's like in the middle of playing that drum, let's say you forgot you were a great violinist and somebody with a violin walks past you, you know? And so the moment your hands begin to remember, it's as if, why am I holding a drum? It doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel like the right instrument. And the person goes through various obstacles. Eventually, they find the right instrument. This right instrument is kind of like saying, finding the proper speed that, and pace that your specific intelligence and DNA functions at. You know, a lot of people want to change their DNA. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, why? 
You know, it's like it's 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 like we reach this situation where it's not about it's about speed and direction. These are really the two things. Free will is velocity, is conscious velocity, control. It's a remarkable event and we are, you know, it's as if imagine you, 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 you got tickets to tomorrow, man. And you are there, but you don't attend the event. Imagine you just stay in the hotel room. So it's as if there's something very important going on, but the person's inner realm calculations have denied the access to that outer realm event. And that event, that EDM concert that we, we are in the hotel sleeping, the whole species, is the full use of maximizing the effort of the mind. That means that right now, it's like we have this bad attitude of trying to see glorification as somebody who knows. You know, we got to kind of push the civilization towards skill orientation. That means uh, it would become way more dramatic. And th think of it this way. Imagine in like, whew, imagine in 500 years, there's a chance we might become a silent civilization. So we're like, oh my God, we got a timer. So while we are alive now, we incorporate a level of theatrics to human display, do you know? And at the same time, a level of freedom to share the inner realms because now you have the microphone of existence in your hand. So when we have a civilization where human beings every day are living it doesn't matter their belief. It doesn't matter what they're doing. But just they move towards the new. That means imagine, I don't know why nobody did it, you know. But you can technically make the future a religion. All the questions that all religions, all the things that a religion needs, you could say it will arise in the future. It's like, what do you believe in? Futurism, man. What does that mean? It's like, whatever the future is going to happen, that's what I mean. <laughs> However way the future is going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the, you know, the smoothest, you know, answer, non-answer, you know? <laughs> it's, it's like, I don't know. It's like we have a natural design, but we're not living in accordance to it. And then we're wondering uh, why we're tripping uh, over, you know, making mistakes towards extinction. Because we are, we have separated ourselves from nature's uh, occurrence. And we had to, to actually develop our individualism. But There is way more to life that can that can be spoken about. I want to see a poet who I haven't actually gone into a cold tunnel before. It's this Persian poet named Ferdosi. And you know, of course, I don't know how many people know this, but uh, mythologies of cultures tend to arise from poets. Even Greek mythology came from a poet. So poetry has a huge uh, influence in how a species opens up to the collective unconscious. So here's some quotes from Ferdowsi.
Okay, guys. So this this guy's full name is uh, uh, I didn't uh, Ferdosi Abdul Qasim Ferdosi Tusi. So he's um, <clears throat> Persian poet, author of the Shahnameh, which is one of the world's longest epic poems created by a single poet. Ferdowsi says, and, no, and now may the blessing of God rest upon all men. I have, this guy was alive, by the way, let me tell you when he was alive. He died 1020, a thousand years ago, literally. <clears throat> so this guy, is he, the last time he was here was a thousand years ago. So what I'm reading for you is from a thousand years ago. <clears throat> uh, translated so far and whatever capacity. <clears throat> Ferdosi says, and now may the blessing of God rest upon all men. I have told unto them the epic of kings and the epic of kings is come to a close and the tale of their deeds is ended. Ferdosi says, and the blood of brave men was shed like unto the shedding of rain from a black cloud. Ferdowsi says, now when the two armies meet, uh, when the two armies met, many and fierce were the combats waged between them, and blows were given and received, and swords flashed, and showers of arrows descended on all sides. Ferdowsi says, how shall a man escape from that which is written? How shall he free from his flee from his destiny? Helmet was joined to helmet, and spear to spear, and jewels, baggage, and elephants without number went with them. And you would have said it was a host that none could understand. And uh, this quote website is not satisfactory. Right, hold on, guys. <laughs> Okay, guys, um, anyways, fair to see, I'm going to read one more quote. There isn't that many quotes from him, actually. He says, now there was fought a battle such as men have not seen the like, and the earth was covered with steel, and arrows fell from the clouds like hail, and the ground was torn with hoofs, and blood flowed like water upon the plains, and the dead lay around in masses, and the feet of horses could not stir because of that. This dude's tripping over war. Uh, hang on, guys. I gotta find a better page. Uh... All right, guys, I found some nice quotes. He says, I turn to right and left. In all the earth, I see no signs of justice, sense, or worth. A man does evil deeds, and all his days are filled with luck and universal praise. Another's good. In all he does, he dies a wretched, broken man whom all despise. Ferdosi says, but all this world is like a tale we hear. Men's evil and their glory disappear. Wow. There we go. That's a, it's a story. The mind is experiencing life as a story. The body is experiencing it as a character in the story. <clears throat> you know, it's like the body is 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 uh, um, the character is the body. The world of the character is the mind, and the soul is the witness of the body and the mind, as is.
Fair those, he says, I am deathless, I am the eternal Lord, for I have spread the seed of the word. His poetry is so incredible. Ferdos, he says, our lives pass from us like the wind, and why should wise men grieve to know that they must die? The Judas blossom fades, the lovely face of light is dimmed, and darkness takes its place. Ferdos, <coughs> Ferdos he says, and while one And while one is brought up with luxury and caresses, and is thrown bewildered and despairing into a dark pit, another is lifted from the pit and raised to a throne where a jeweled crown is placed on his head. The world has no shame in doing this. It is prompt to hand out both pleasure and pain, and has no need of us in, uh, uh, and our doings. Yeah, he's saying pretty much there's the nature's mind is, doesn't have the language-based morality we do, you know. Ferdos, he says, from moment then to moment their desire gained strength, and wisdom fled before love's fire, passion engulfed them, and these lovers lay entwined together till the break of day. <sighs> Guys, I want to make something clear. I personally have declared in my own, the way I see life is that language cannot contain truth, and Really, any linguistic performance <clears throat> is as temporary as the attention that keeps is the, is the spotlight for that performance. The attention of your mind is not limited to the suffering of your body. You know, that even pain, any sensation can be witnessed. What are we? We are a moment of sensory uh, sculpt. Uh, we are like a sensory sculpture of the moment, you know, that when the eyes open, the world appears. When the eyes close, it's as if a dimension has, has gone to like, a, a, as if like the, <clears throat> like the web page has gone to behind the other web page, you know what I mean? The web page window. So we got to stop uh, <clears throat> playing language costume games and usher in the new human being advanced communicator the selfless self selfless individual activity selfish collective that means an advanced civilization should want a lot you know that means it's like an, uh, when we think of a person individual person we're like no 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 the, you know that makes the ego big well when we want a civilization we want the civilization with the biggest ego we are right now we are having egos if we, our ego became our species, our civilization's ego, imagine a thousand years from now, will we be wearing the ideas that we are wearing now? Language dies because the attention moves on. And that's the extraordinary thing about this world, that we are an attributeless present witnessing uh, the interweaving of sound and form as we move. The witness of the elemental, the witness of the ever-present mind, and access to the memory that never changed.
sorry guys, this was on mute. I don't know how long this was on mute, but I was just speaking. Um, um, anyways, guys, I want to continue. And guys, remember, the words you speak become the house you live in. You know, like a, a person who's understood the silence doesn't say anything. They, they are conscious. You know, what I mean by that is like, um, if you if it could feel the echo of your language, if the karma of everything you did was instantaneous, then the person would instantly know what to do and what not to do. <clears throat> Anyways, I'm going to read some poems from Senai. I, I was talking, this was on mute, so I'm going to just catch the listeners up. Sanai is this um, Persian poet um, around the time 1080. He was like after Ferdowsi. You could totally see him inspired by Ferdowsi. <clears throat> and um, Sanai Ghaznavi, uh, I'm going to just read a bunch of his quotes, go into his quote tunnel right now in regards to just the point of these quote tunnels is I'm trying to read how I'm trying to see like how people back in the day looked at the world, how their eyes opened up to the meaning of the world, <clears throat> you know? So if a person can tr surpass, bypass their own cultural programming, they can learn endlessly from different things. Sanai says, when the path ignites the soul, there's no remaining in place. The foot touches ground, but not for long. Sanai says, while reason is still tracking down the secret, you end your quest on the open field of love. Sanai says, as long as you cling to yourself, you will wander right and left, day and night, for thousands of years. And when, after all that effort, you finally open your eyes, you will see yourself through inherent defects, wandering around itself, uh, wandering around itself like the ox in a mill. But if, once freed of yourself, there's a space between the word your and self here. But if, once freed of yourself, you finally get down to work, this door will open to you within two minutes. <clears throat> the point of it is a trust. Sanai says, knowing what you know, be serene also, like a mountain, and do not be distressed by misfortune. Knowledge without serenity is an unlit candle. Wow. Knowledge without serenity, that's the experience component to it. That means the intellect needs experiential serenity. If we can mix that in, in, in uh, the educational system, bingo. Knowledge without serenity is an unlit candle. Together they are a honeycomb. Honey without wax is a noble thing. Wax without honey is only fit for burning. <clears throat> so, you know, it's kind of unique. It's like... We have a physical relationship with our world. Then we have a relationship with how this physical image in our inner realms has this ability to become malleable and even parallelized. You know, <laughs> like become, it becomes like a parallel multi. You could see probabilities of one thing. As if you look at a cup and you can see it holding it with your right hand, left hand, but you haven't moved at all. You know, you it's in your inner realms. You're perceiving that. You know. So anyways, guys, <clears throat> thanks for, uh, I mean, before I end it off, let me talk about this. Um, archetypal self-defining. Let's say you don't know who you are. You know, most people feel they know who they are. But let's say you don't know. How would you start to know? Let's say you don't know who you are and you're like trying to figure out how you can know. <laughs> so you will look around and as you look around you your attention meets a landscape if your mind doesn't fear looking at phenomena you will actually see a lot from your world you know you see the punishment <clears throat> there is no punishment you punish yourself by not living for your greater opportunity Language comes and goes. Language is a film. You know, it's like living inside a film. I call it the linguistic simulation. It's really where poetry exists, where all these words have a value. That means this, this body right now, this biological body, I am very well aware 
that there will come a moment even this has to move on. You know, and so when the body has to move on, all that it remains is the work of your mind. What did your mind do while you had a body? That is the question. Not that what where will your mind be after your body. It's like the after your body, you don't have to have in the afterlife, you don't have to worry about life. So now that you're in life, you have to worry about life, you know. Now is the only it's like it, it, people think honestly, it's 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 terrifying to feel that people think knowledge is only in the educational system. You know, I mean, it's like the universities are giving us a clue. University. The whole universe is your university. Your universal sector is your assignment. And yet we are limited to seats uncomfortable. We are limited to playing along with the inefficient as if we don't see a better world. When we see a better world, how can you not move towards it? When you see a better way you can do something, how can you not do anything about it? It's like, why is the content there? Sometimes the most shamanic experience I've had in my life, it's not even anything. It's just moments where I ask myself, why am I looking at all of this like this? And there is an utter silence. As if the inner silence of the inner realms and the silence of the outer realms have met and in the middle there's like a two mirrors where language infinitely moves. I wrote this book which hopefully this week I'm gonna build a proper website and get this whole thing on a more serious level but I wrote this book called The Inventor's Sphere and it was this book at the time I wrote it in 2013, 12, 13 around that time. And the inventor sphere, I wrote two books, these two books, The Ancient Listeners and The Inventor Sphere. These are unpublished books for now. These two books, uh, let me tell you how I wrote them. This is worth sharing, guys. I went to this park called Edwards Garden, and I had my laptop, and I remember I somehow in my, in my the intuitive feeling I had was that I have to write two books at the same time. So my mind was attempting to write two books at the same time. I had like a like an hour or so, you know, I could spare. So when I was in, in I sat in this park alone with my laptop and there was a moment where I would just press record. I would sit in front of it and I would actually my attention would go to nature, but after a while it would just stabilize. And after the moment it was stabilized, it was as if suddenly I would just start going with the inner realms and vocalizing the inner realms. And so I would record a chapter for the inventor sphere. Then I would record a chapter for the uh, ancient listeners. Then a chapter for the inventor sphere. Then a cha chapter for the ancient listeners. So I would write two. You might not believe it, but there is something. Like uh, you can multitask a lot of things. It's just the project becomes bigger, the more specific attention it requires. You know, the more playful life is, the more actually ultimate maintenance you can have. So the whole point of the inventor's sphere, ancient listeners, I'll keep it for another talk, but the, like the, I've made a channel called Mr. Within's Library. Those are the, that channel is dedicated to me explaining everything, all my, all the books I've written and all that. So people can uh, follow that if they like, but uh. The mentor sphere was accessing the source of energetic knowing. You see, there's a way right now we're knowing things again through the linguistic simulation, through language, idea, conception. But then there's a way you're knowing the moment, just energy being there. If you can get comfortable with how you are an energetic being before you're an ideological being and you actually experientially notice this, you know, the inventor's sphere is really recognizing that you have access to a mind that while simultaneously considering a limited visible life is simultaneously living a limitless invisible life. We are the thoughts of the archaic God looking we are the thoughts of God looking at God being like we know, we know the mind's here. Some mind is here. Something is here. There's another tenant uh, on this planet. 
As Terence McKenna says, there's another tenant in this room. I will tell you that tenant is, is we have been from the beginning. The subjective evolution has been the gift of a collective being. We are in symbiosis with the collective being. We don't realize it. Our minds are the collective being. Our bodies are different. So technically, we, we have never been embodied and we have always been mind. So welcome to a universe where mind stepped into the room before the body did. And imagine, like, I, I can't tell you, like, <sighs> there's a scene in a, one of my science fiction, uh, chapters of my science fiction, <clears throat> where there is a pilot in a sky city, and this pilot has come to humanity lifted, lifted into the sky, you know? recruiting interstellar pilots. Can you imagine being a pilot and you're trying to recruit other pilots to try hyperspeed spaceships? Do you know what I mean? That's the thing. We, we have forgotten to aim high because we have identified with the low. <clears throat> because we have identified that we have fallen, we feel we can't rise. <laughs> This reality is ridiculous. You know, it's a, it's a play of elements that at some point found a mind that could tell themselves a story to realize it was void, to then realize what is in the void. And then the isness of how there is an attention here is the miracle of how form moves. The prime mover is of intelligence. It doesn't necessarily mean it's an intelligence limited to the human body. You know, maybe in the future we're going to suddenly realize we created the internet and maybe in, the, in a thousand years, you know, the children of those, that future humanity will look at us and be like, oh my God, these guys built an internet, but they didn't realize they had actually access to a natural one. <laughs> that means we were the internet before we made the internet. You know, that's what's up. You know, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know there, is, there is something about human beings being like a ma our whole species being like an antenna with an interaction as, as a collective form, you know, it's like, um, we, it's like we have, think of it this way. There is 8 billion horses. <laughs> oh man. No, no, let me, let me use another, <laughs> you know, let's, let, okay. Let me not horse around here. Let me <laughs> I don't know. It's like, the honor seems to be the most efficient thing you can do, actually, in, um, in the void. It's like, that's the unthinkable. That's one thing nobody thought of, you know? When you realize your mind doesn't have a shape, you will laugh as if you will laugh like an eternal being. When you realize the mind is into shape and it's just the language that is echoing the, like all you can say the way Carl Jung saw it was the person who thought they had an interaction with an angel. That was an archetype. That was your unconscious showing you another way of beinghood, how you can be. That's it. The mind is just endlessly being endless. <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope this episode was helpful. Just an emphasis on define yourself. If you define yourself by the past, you can't do anything. You're defined by the past. If you define yourself by the future, you keep it unknown. So you keep your potential alive and then your choice becomes your road. So thanks for listening, guys. Much blessings and all.